yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap with bed. With the church a few times, now none's trying to give me head. What's that? It, I mean, in, in, for dental surgery, sure, yeah. yes. I, I like to think I, I'm known for other things. Okay, all right, so today, guys, we're gonna talk about server-side, uh, or UDS, user defined function, server-side logic execution. Um, so we, in the intro class, we do cover this topic again. Uh, we re revived it this past semester. Um, but now for this lecture here, we're gonna see about why, in particular, user defined functions are, are problematic and some automated ways to actually improve this. So, um, until now, for, for, the, for, the, for the entire semester, we've assumed that all the logic that we would have for our application, um, like, you know, what, what was typically called like the business logic, or anything trying to like explain what the application wants to do, that obviously exists in the application code, right? The Python, Ruby, J JavaScript, whatever. And so the way the, database, the application is gonna interact with the database system is through what is called a conversational API. Next, class, next class, we will discuss this in more detail, what ODBC, GDBC looks like. But the basic idea is that you run some application code. It, at some point, it, set, it needs to get data from the, from the database. So it runs a query. The, query, the, the database processes that query. You get back results. And you use some processing on it. And maybe you go back to the database server and get, get, more, uh, get some more data. Right? So it basically looks like this. You have some, some application code, uh, some, some, you, know, you get an execution. You, at some point, you hit, you hit a you know, SQL command. That's got to go over the network to the database server, which then has to do the parsing, the planning, the optimizing, and then actually execute the query, all the stuff that we've talked about so far. All right? And so why this occurs, this is typically going to be a blocking call. The newer version of the Python, uh, Python Postgres library, Sycog G, that has support for asynchronous uh, query commands. So like you, can, you can asynchronously call this and get the result back later as a future. Most applications aren't written like that. Most of them, this is a blocking call. So then now you get back the result from the database server. The database server is sitting idle, at least for this connection. Uh, if, it's, if it's supporting multiple connections at the same time, then it could do other work. Um, for our work, for OLAP queries, this is not a big deal if it's idle because we're not going to hold any locks because we're not doing transactions. But then the, the application takes the output of this query, does some kind of logic on it. We're not going to find what that is at this point. But it's something that they didn't express in SQL. Then it's going to execute more queries, go back, get more data, do some other updates, whatever you want, do some more processing, and then commit, and you're done. Right? So that, this is how most applications are, are, are written uh, today. Right? So the idea of embedding the database logic or application logic inside the database system is that we want to move the things that we, we, were, we were writing procedural code in the application to put it now inside the database server. And the benefits of this are obviously fewer, fewer round trips between the application and the server, because now it's, it's one SQL command uh, or, or, a, or the middle node of, of requests over the network to go get, to go execute some query, and then that program logic is now embedded and running inside the database server itself. Uh, we're not really going to discuss about uh, listen and notify, but in some cases you can get notifications immediately, like when when it changes occurs through triggers. If we're not worried about transactions, but if you're, worried, if you're holding blocks, there's less network round trips, so the time it takes for it before a transaction can commit is, is reduced. But the other two benefits are going to be, the major benefits are going to be the, the application programmers don't have to re-implement the, the same functionality over and over again for different variations of the application. Now, typically, you would have, like, the, there's the web interface, and then there's the, the, mo the mobile phone interface. Those are be talking to the application server not the database directly. Some cases, some applications do talk to the database directly. And in that case, instead of having the application have to re-implement between the mobile phone and, and, the, and the web server version, uh, some logic, you just can write these things as, as UDFs or store procedures, embed that in the database server, and then all the different versions of the application can, can reuse this. And of course, obviously, we want to extend the functionality of the database system, going beyond what the built-in uh, the, the built uh, capabilities are. So this is actually the, the motivation of, of Postgres, right? When Stonebreaker was building Ingress, he always talks about how there was some customer that, uh, well, when they're trying to sell Ingress to the banks, all the banks computed interest in uh, using Julian dates instead of the Gregorian calendar, right? So to, in order to support now doing interest for the banks, they had to go implement a new type and a new, new operators, new functions to operate on the bank, the, the date format that the banks wanted. 
So with Postgres, the idea was like you make it extensible from the very beginning so that you don't have to rewrite the server or you, know, you, you rely on the application programmer, the person using the database system to extend the functionality very easily without having to recompile whole, the whole system. All right, so this UDF stuff really comes back to, uh, it was Sybase was the early one in the 1980s, but this, this all came out in the 1980s because people wanted to extend the functionality of the system without having to re recompile everything. So the, the sort of the four or five major types of, um, of sort of embedded database logic are going to be user-defined functions, UDFs, which we'll focus on mostly in this class. Stored procedures are basically UDFs, except you can invoke them without having to embed them inside of a SQL query. Um, triggers are get, get fired off when you, there's some event occurs, like a table gets updated, you fire a trigger, and then you're basically invoking a function. And then UDTs and UDAs, which I talked a little bit about before when we talked about Project 2 or Project 3, um, these exist, but they're not as common as, as the other ones. And so this survey here comes from uh, the Freud guys in a, in a follow-up paper from the paper you guys read, where they looked at all the different object types that exist in real-world customers' databases in, in, in Azure SQL, so their cloud version of SQL Server. And what they find is that over, almost 70% of the different kind of embedded logic is going to be stored procedures. And UDFs are only 24%. So uh, for this class, again, we're going to focus on UDFs. But some of the logic that we'll talk about today in Floyd could also be applied for, for stored procedures. Right? Because there's multiple SQL queries, and you combine these things together. Right? So an another side comment I'll say as well, too. In the SQL Server world, there's a strict, uh, strict economy or difference between UDFs and stored procedures. Store procedures in, in SQL Server, they're the only function type that can update the database, like, like call updates, insert update deletes. In UDS, you can't, in SQL Server, you can't call insert update delete. You have to be read only. In PLBG SQL and Postgres, they don't have that limitation. So you do all sorts of crazy things like your UDF that you call in a where clause for a select statement could then do updates to the database. But you know, we'll ignore that today, OK? All right, so today's class, we're going to focus on UDS because that's what the Freud paper is about. But again, like the lo same logic can be applied to, uh, to store procedures. So at a high level, it looks like this. So we're going to take this portion of our application code and now embed that as some function. I'm showing a pseudo code here. That gets now registered and stored inside the database system. So now I can rewrite my application to call the SQL statement that will then invoke whatever that function is that I had before. Right. So in this example here, it's still two network round trips uh, for these two queries. But you can imagine in other cases where I could have more complex things that execute more queries. And if everything's embedded inside the database server, then I don't have this issue. So today's class, we're going to start to talk about background about UDFs. And then we'll focus on, uh, then we'll discuss, the, again, the, the Freud technique. And then we'll talk about an alternative Freud uh, from a different set of Germans where you Instead of converting from relational algebra expressions and injecting that or inlining that directly in the database server, they're going to convert UDFs into other SQL statements using CTEs. Uh, and then I've asked Sam to uh, provide some, some additional commentary on his opinion about the, the papers uh, because he's, he's thought about this and either, I guess, the, expectat or the, the, the claims in the paper don't actually ma match up with what happens in the real world when he and Kai were running benchmarks. Okay. All right, so I think I've already said this, UDS. The idea here is that the, sorry, what's wrong? What was wrong? Sorry. I just said it's not a rant anymore. Yeah, it's an, it's an, it's an erudite commentary. Yeah. <laughs> it's more refined. OK. Um, so uh, all right, so UDF is, is going to be a function that's going to be written, by, again, by the application developer that is going to extend the functionality of the data system beyond what uh, its built-in operations can support. All right? And so the. The, the computation that, that UDF is going to, going to perform could be anything you would sort of expect in a, in a, in a sort of standard imperative language, going beyond what SQL can actually do. So for loops, while loops, if clauses, it can invoke other SQL statements, it can invoke other functions, right? You can do things that would be quite difficult to do just purely in, in SQL. So the function is basically, all these functions will take in some input arguments, be a, a scalars, an array of scalars. Uh, you can't take in table or row sets. Um, and then you do some kind of computation on them, and then you return result, and the result could either be a, uh, again, some more scalars or additional tables and row sets, right? And you can embed these sort of in, any, anywhere in, inside, the, 
instead of a SQL query. So the easiest type of UDF you can have are called SQL functions, where it literally is just the, the body of the, of, the, of the UDF itself. It's just a bunch of SQL statements. So in this case here, we have defining the function. This is the name. This is our input arguments. Uh, then we have our, our return arguments. And then we define what the, what the query type is, or the UDF type is. In this case, here, it's, a, it's a, the language is SQL. And then the function body is this SQL query here. And I can have multiple queries. And then the output of the, of the return result of this function is whatever the, the return result of the last query that I executed. All right? So all this up here, like the returns and language, we'll see this in a second. But this is the, the, the UDF language in the SQL standard is this thing called SQL PSM, uh, which is derived or, or inspired by Ada. Who here has ever heard of Ada, the programming language? Yeah, it's small, all right. it's, which is an extension of Pascal from the 70s. Right? The guy that defined the, 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 this for the SQL standard really loved Pascal or Ada, and that's why this all looks like this. Right? So now I can evoke the, the, the UDF either in the Again, in the select output here, I could put it, in this case here, because I'm returning a, or a, a row set, I can put it in you know, the select output. I can put it in, in a from clause. I can have it in a where clause using, again, set, set operators. All right. You can also do other interesting things like provide annotations, like this case here. In the SQL standard, you can define this as being atomic. Uh, and then tells the database system that you should try to try to track the dependencies between what this thing is, what, you know, what table this is calling and who's calling this. So there are some hints you can provide to the database server to tell it uh, you know, what, what this thing is actually going to do. So that way, if, you, uh, if one UDF calls another UDF, or this UDF calls a table that then gets dropped, uh, you would then throw an error to say this thing can't be dropped. Right? So there are annotations you can provide about the UDFs to give more hints to the database server uh, what, what the UDF is actually doing. Again, if it's a SQL UDF, you can parse this. You can parse this inner parts. You would know exactly what tables it's touching. The challenge that is then when you start using a sort of a, a non-declarative or non-SQL programming language to define your UDS, right? an external programming language. So again, the SQL standard since 1996 defines the UDF language is in SQL as being this thing called SQL PSM, uh, persistent stored stored modules. I think it's called, right? Uh, and so with the challenge though in, in in SQL, in all cases databases, there's a SQL standard. Nobody actually follows it exactly, right? Because Oracle and DB2, they defined their own uh, query language. Oracle had PL SQL. DB2 had SQL PL, but now they also support PL SQL. So SQL PSM looks a lot like o Oracle's, uh, but not exactly. There are, there are some minor differences, right? So again, SQL standard is like all the different vendors try to get together and say, hey, I have this new feature. I want it in the SQL standard. And then somebody says, oh, my other feature looks very similar to yours, but mine's different. I want mine in there. And then you end up with like the lowest common denominator, and, and it's not exactly the same as, as any one system actually supports. So no one truly supports the SQL standard. And so the, these UDF languages is a, is a good example of this problem. So you can get, I think, for, I know for Postgres, there's an extension to make it support SQL PSM. Um, and then DB2, you can get pretty close to SQL PSM as well. Oracle, again, has, has their own thing. The, the one that's going to be quite different and what the Freud paper is going to be focused on is this thing called Transact SQL or T SQL. Uh, so T SQL, Transact SQL comes from Sybase. Sybase was, again, one of the, one of the first systems to support UDFs in the, actually, it might be the first system that did support UDFs in, uh, in the world uh, in the 1980s. And again, before the SQL standard was a thing, they defined their own, uh, their own language called Transact SQL. SQL Server uses Transact SQL because it's a fork of Sybase. Again, Microsoft bought a, for, bought a license to, to rewrite the source code for Sybase to port it to Windows NT uh, in the early 1990s. And then since then, they've completely rewritten most of, if not all, of SQL Server. But it still maintains the, the compatibility with Transact SQL. Sybase still exists. They were bought by STP. It still makes them a lot of money. But no startup would say, hey, I'm going to use Sybase, right? So, these are the ones that we, we focused on today, how to take these sort of procedural imperative languages, convert them into, into relational algebra and SQL. There's other sort of more common programming languages, like Python and Java and C, if you're crazy, that you can write UDFs in. Um, and the different systems will support them in different ways. 
it's like obviously, if you write, you've write your UDF in C, and you link that as a shared object to the database server, you can see everything in the address space of the database system. Therefore, you can do some stupid things and cause it to crash. Postgres will let you do that. Other systems, like uh, in Oracle, will, will compile your C UDF into their own dialect of C, and then they'll run it either, I can't forget if it always runs to the case or it's sometimes, but they'll run it as a separate process in a sandbox that'll go over like an IPC to send commands back and forth to the database server to prevent you from doing something you shouldn't be doing. Right, because it's obviously a huge security hole if you, if you, you can link in any shared object <laughs> that's written in C. All right, so let's, let's look at an example of this. So this is gonna be coming now from the, uh, from the Freud guys, and so this is gonna be for SQL Server, and so, so this UDF here will be in, uh, in Transact SQL. And the what, easy way to tell whether you're looking at Transact SQL versus PL SQL is if, if, if you see these at signs where they declare for variables, right? PL SQL or PL PG SQL doesn't, doesn't use this. All right, so for this UDF, uh, we're gonna get all the customer IDs uh, from, the, from the, the orders table. Um, we'll get all the customer IDs and compute their customer service level based on the amount of money you have spent as derived in the orders table here, right? So the invoking query just does for every single customer. Then you call this customer level UDF where you pass from the customer key. And you see here that now we, we, we define, we have a function. Here's the, here's the body of it. Again, as, as, as a remnant of Pascal and Ada, you have to define all your variables at the beginning of the function. Um, who here has actually ever written anything in Pascal? That's what they taught me when, when I was in high school. It was a long time ago. I, whatever, it's fine. Um, but the, all right, so the Thomas Neumann loves Pascal. That's what, that's, he confessed that to me last week or two weeks ago. Anyway, I was very surprising. And there are some data systems written in Pascal. All right, so you declare all your variables ahead of time. Then you do this uh, summation query on the customer key, store the output of the summation into this uh, total variable. And then if the, if the, the, the value of this total variable is greater than a than million dollars, then you set them as platinum. Otherwise, you set, set them as regular and you return that, right? Pretty simple, right? So as I've already said before, the great thing about UDS uh, is that they're gonna encourage, you know, you, you'll get modularity, you get code reuse, because now again, whatever that logic I have in my UDF, any, any query, is, assuming they have the right permissions to access it, can, can, can reuse it without having to re-implement it themselves. And we're gonna get net, less network round trips for complex operations. Uh, and of course, obviously some logic will be easier to express in a, uh, in a procedural language like PL SQL. Uh, then writing it as, as pure SQL, as we'll see in some examples in a second. That's debatable, right, whether that's easier to read or easy, easier to write. Um, for ML and data analysis tasks, maybe, uh, but usually those things don't, you don't, you wouldn't express, like a machine learning algorithm in PL SQL, you make a call to, to an outside function to do it for you, like something like PyTorch. All right, so these things we've already said before, this is kind of obvious, but let's talk about when things go bad or why, this, why the UDS can be bad. So the number one problem is gonna be is that the database system doesn't know what's in the UDF, right? It's gonna treat it as a black box because it's a procedural language and it doesn't know what it's gonna do until it actually runs it. Now, my example before was pretty easy, right? You, you do a summation, then there's an if clause. But in some UDFs, they can do crazy things like declare a string and then start appending to that string to construct a SQL query and then invoke whatever the SQL query that's defined in that string. So the database system has, is going to have no idea what, 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 what it's actually going to do at runtime because, it, again, it can't, it's not a declarative language. The, the, what the, the query is going to do or what the, the UDF is going to do is going to depend on you know, what row it's looking at, what the data looks like, and so forth. Right? So the database system is not going to be able to understand what's, what's the, the cost of executing that function. And then in some cases where the, if the UDF is being used in a where clause as part of a predicate, it's not, not going to do the selectivity of, of that predicate. So a really stupid example would be where value equals mighty UDF, and I pass in some constant one, two, three. Right? So what, what is the selectivity of this? Nobody knows, because right? it depends on what this, this function is actually doing. Right? So in most cases, the optimizer just gives up, or it doesn't give up, but like, it'll set it to some constant value that's really high. I right? say, so this, this, this is bad. But I have, to, I, have to, I have to put some value in. So it won't pick affinity, but it'll pick something that, that's arbitrarily high. I think there's a pound to find somewhere in Postgres that 
I forget what the actual constant is, but there's a pound defined. They say, if I see UDF, here's the selectivity of it. The additional challenge is that it's going to be difficult for us to parallelize UDFs because we can have correlated queries being executed inside of them. Right? So because of this, so again, since we don't know what's going on inside of it, the database system is going to be very conservative, and it's going to decide to execute the, the, within a single query each UDF one at a time. Right? You can't run them in parallel the ways we, we've been talking about before. Uh, you could run it potentially on, if, you, if there's a hint to say you know that the UDF is, is read-only or won't have any side effects, then you could have different threads run it in, in, in parallel on different portions of the table like using the morsels approach that we talked about before. Uh, but if that's not the case, then you've got to really run it sequentially uh, because you don't know whether the output of the, of the, the there will be some change that the UDF is going to make that could affect the result of the next UDF invocation. Right? Again, this is also the reason why the, the, the SQL Server guys don't want you to put any updates into to UDS because you don't want these, these weird side effects where depending what order you execute the UDS, you may get different results for your query. Right? You, you don't want that to happen. All right, keeps going, gets worse. Okay. So although the optimizer one is pretty bad. So the other challenge is going to be now is that you can't, uh, you're not going to be able to execute the, the UDFs in, in sort of using batches in the you know, vectorized processing model that we talked about before, because again, you don't know, uh, you don't know what's going on inside the UDF, and you don't know how it's going to relate to sort of one invocation to the next. So Microsoft had coins this term called RBAR row by agonizing row. So you can't do the vectorized approach that we talked about where they get a batch of tuples and maybe apply it to the function all at once. In their world, in their implementation, they're going to execute the UDF for each row one at a time. Right? And, and that's going to be slow. So because now we're executing each UDF one by one, now it's going to be challenging for us to do sort of cross-statement optimizations within even the UDF. Uh, because again, it can't reason about, I see this query and then this query, and I could maybe execute them together as a single join or merge that with, with what's going on the calling query. Again, it just treats it as a black box and it can't do any additional optimizations. So we'll see this in a second. One of the optimizations that, that, that SQL Server did try before they got to the Freud stuff is that, well, they say, okay, well, the function is expensive to invoke because uh, there's a sort of context switch for every single row. They'll compile it down to machine code using the, the, you know, the query, you know, similar to the query compilation techniques that we talked about before. And that just makes the interpretation of the procedures of the commands inside the UDF faster. But he still doesn't solve all the other problems where, again, it's treated like a black box to the database system or to the query optimizer. Ah, OK. All right. So here's another UDF. Uh, well, here's a query that's going to invoke a UDF. And this, again, from the Freud paper, this is a derived example from uh, based on a TPCH query 12, where they've added this little piece here where they're going to go do a lookup to see whether the customer key is, is, is going to be null. And in this case here, the answer is it, it will never be null. But again, because the UDF is a black box, it doesn't know what this thing is ever going to return. So therefore, it's going to have to do this check every single time. So all the UDF is actually doing is just looking up, uh, given, given for a given customer key, does a look up in the customer table and just returns back the, like the, the, the customer name. Right? So again, the customer table for on the, on the, the, the name of the customer table in TPCH is not null, but because again the, the optimizer doesn't know that this thing is just doing a lookup on something that can never be null, it has to execute it every single time for every single row. Right? So for the original query, without this additional check, uh, it's going to run in 800 milliseconds. But if I rewrite it at this UDF for a pretty simple check, it then gets converted to 13 hours for this same query on the same data. I think this is like TPCH scale factor 1. So it's a 1 gigabyte database. All right? Again, and that's not a, I'm not saying this is a this is not a, a, a knock on SQL Server because I think SQL Server is a great system uh, for what it is, for you know for what it's trying to be. Uh, but this is just the nature of UDS of how bad things can get. Also, too, we'll say I'll, we'll cover this. I think next, starting next week, 
the SQL Server Query Optimizer is probably the, the best one in the world. Can't do everything. The Germans have a pretty good one too. But in terms of like all the things that can do, it's probably the best, at least for a commercial system. And if they're, if they're choking on this getting 13 hours, like process is, is going to be a train wreck. Right? So a preview, I, I would say, for well, what we're talking about in Freud, if you run the same operation with Freud and then inline this directly into the SQL query, they can get it to 900 milliseconds. Right? So it's slower than the original query without this additional check because you know, you're, adding, you're adding additional join, but it's not the 13 hours uh, blowout that you would get if you, if you actually had the UDF. So, all right, I'm sort of jumping ahead to what, to what Freud can do, but there's other things we could do to try to speed up the UDF. We've already talked about the first one. You can do compilation. You can take the UDF, the, the procedural code, do a transpilation, convert it into you know, either C or whatever, whatever, um, whatever, whatever intermediate representation you'd have for, for, you know, in your system, and then compile that into machine code. So Oracle does this. Uh, I think Hyper can maybe do this as well. Right? If you're doing a holistic query compilation that we talked about with Hyper, like converting the actual query plan into machine code, then you can just inline the, the UDF now to be directly, you know, the code directly inside like the where clause piece that, that you're compiling. But again, that doesn't solve the optimizer problem. The optimizer still doesn't know what, what the, the selectivity of the UDF is going to be. So you can do parallelization that we talked about before. Right? You rely on the user to write annotations in the UDF and say, is it read-only? What parts can be parallelized and so forth? Uh, MemSQL had something like this. They called it MPL, the MemSQL programming language. I think it might have got renamed when, it, when they renamed the single store. But they had a parallel UDF language that was to ba had the basic idea here. And then the thing we're going to focus on in today's class is the inlining. So how to take a UDF that, that's, uh, that's written in a sort of procedural code, convert that into a declarative form, and then inject that into the query that, that's calling it, either as another SQL, uh, embedded SQL queries, inline SQL queries, or nested SQL queries, or nested relational algebra expressions. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So let's talk about what led to SQL Server building out Freud. Right. So in 2001, Microsoft added support for uh, and transact SQL for scalar UDS, right? Seems like a logical thing uh, you know, a database system would want to do because you want to have people start you know, writing more complex queries and more com em embedding the logic into to your system. So this is around 10 years after the, the, the system was originally launched, the first version of SQL Server. I think it actually came out in like 92, 93. All right, so then by 2008, people started realizing that UDS are evil. Uh, and there was you know, a famous blog article called UDFs are evil. Uh, that basically goes to all the things that we talked about before. Right? In this example here, they, like, if you add a UDF, you go from you know, two seconds to, uh, what is that, 38,000 milliseconds, 38 seconds, right? just by adding UDF. Right? So, so it sort of became well known that UDFs were evil amongst the developers. Two years later, later Microsoft acknowledged that were, the UDFs were evil. I even wrote a blog article that talks about how uh, UDFs are evil, right? Overall evil personified, they wrote here, right? Uh, so this is a updated version of the blog article from 2016, but the original version came out in, in 2010. So then uh, in 2014, the guy that is going to invent in Freud, uh, Karthik Ramachandri, Tandra, uh, he finished his PhD in IIT Bombay on doing decorrelations of, of UDS. Uh, IIT Bombay is probably the, is the best uh, database school in all of India. Um, so he got his PhD out of there. But then he joins the Jim Gray Systems Lab, begins the, the, which is Madison, Wisconsin, uh, you know, named after Jim, Jim Gray, founded the Freud Project in 2015 after graduating. And then in three years later, they were able to get SQL Server to ship, or sorry, Freud to ship in SQL Server 2019. Right? In the documentation, they talk about doing this inlining. They're not going to call it Freud because that's, that's the research project. And, and you know, the average programmer is not going to know what the hell that is or even know what you know, a Sigma paper is. Um, but the, the, the implementation or the technique that's described in the Sigma paper that you, that you guys read about is in, was shipped in SQL Server in 2019. So just give you a sense. The reason why I like this paper, and, and I've said this before, like 
why I think SQL Server is a state-of-the-art system. This is very impressive to get something that was a research project and then, you know, that you were building, and then three years later, get it actually shipped in production code. Because database systems and database companies are typically, at least for the enterprise ones, are typically very conservative in how quickly they put out new features. Because right? the last thing you would want is put out a feature that causes people to lose a bunch of data or things to crash or things get much slower, because that affects your reputation. Uh, and again, enterprise customers are, are very, very conservative when it, when it comes to, to your database systems. There's a reason why Oracle and Sybase and, and, and DB2 and SQL Server still make a lot of money because there's a lot of major companies that are still relying on these systems to be, to be rock solid. So again, to get from a research prototype into production in a short amount of time like this is, is impressive. All right, so what is Freud? So Freud is going to convert imperative UDFs uh, that are that into relational algebra expressions that it can then embed or inline to the query plan that calls, calls that UDF. And we can do this without having the application developer to change anything in their UDF code. Right? Again, the great thing about SQL is that uh, if, I, you know, if the hardware changes or the data system changes, the optimizer gets better. It can, you know, from the same SQL query that your application has been using for years, can all, all of a sudden take advantage of new features that the data system provides if you upgrade without having to go back and change any application code. Right? That was the original idea that Ted Codd came up with in the 1970s. So we can do the same thing here for our UDS without requiring the, the de developer to go back and change their UDS to add annotations or do anything differently. We can use Freud to inline them uh, and get speed ups on, on, on the system performance or the application for, for running these queries. All right? So the basic idea of the way it's going to work is we're going to do the conversion of UDFs uh, during the rewrite phase of the query. So, so that means we don't have to change the, sort of the, the query optimizer to be aware of that it's operating on UDFs or doing some transformations on UDF-derived code. All the conversion is done before you get to the cost-based optimizer. And the advantage of this one is, from, is mostly from a software engineering perspective is the, the query optimizer is the hardest part of the system to build. So if I can just do simple rewriting rules, like static rules without a cost model to decide when do I, you know, how, how to do the inlining, then if I could then convert the query plan with the inline UDF into the form that the cost-based optimizer expects, I can just shove it to the cost-based optimizer and let it do all the tricks and optimizations that it normally does for, for regular queries. Right, so that's the big advantage you're going to get with this is that you don't have to do anything special in, in this piece because you just do it in the, in the rewriter phase. Postgres has, has a rewriter. They convert you know, views into SQL just using static rules. So same thing here. We take the UDF, convert it into relational algebra, inject it into the query plan, then hand it off to the optimizer to do whatever it wants to do. Right? The way to think about it at high level is that we're basically going to convert UDS into subqueries, and then the optimizer knows how to deal with subqueries. Caveat some, some examples. We'll get to it in a second. Uh, and then it knows, since it knows how to optimize those, it, it, you know, it doesn't know, doesn't care that it's, that it's optimizing a query that came from a converted UDF. It just sees a SQL query and just does, does its thing on it. Right? All right, so we didn't really talk about subqueries too much in this class. We talked about a little bit in the, uh, the intro class, but I just want to remind everyone what's going on here. Um, so conceptually, a UDF is basically like a subquery. A subquery is like a UDF because if unless you do a conversion to either inline it or decorrelate the subquery, it's going to be treated as if it was a, uh, like a function call with a whole, with a whole separate execution context to invoke that, that, that nested query, get some result, and then return execution to, to the, the call and query, uh, the out of query. Right? So MySQL famously, for, for the longest time, up until like three or four years ago, could not do any decorrelation of, of nested queries. If you had a nested query in, in a where clause for every single tuple in the outer query, it would re-execute that, that inner query, which is like the dumbest thing you could do. Um, and it's basically the example I was showing before with that UDF going from 800 milliseconds to, to 13 hours, because for every single row on the outer table, it's calling the UDF one by one. So the same thing for, for the for nested query if you don't do it right. So the two approaches to handle this, a nested query is either decorrelate them or flatten them, like by rewriting them into a join, or removing the outer query entirely, the inner query entirely. Or the alternative is you extract out the nested query, run it once as like a subplan in Postgres, they call it, 
or like a query before you run the first query, the outer query, materialize its results to a temp table, then now do a join on the outer query, uh, referencing that, that temp table. And then when the query is done, you throw, it, you throw away the temp table. So let's see a really simple example like this. Say we have a table, a bunch of orders. So we want to get the first user that has, has made at least two purchases. So I have my outer query here. Uh, we just do a, you know, go with the user ID, order them by the, by the user ID and the sending order, but only want one. And then the inner query here, here is going to do a lookup where you reference the, uh, the user ID of the outer table, do a join with it on the inner table, but then you do the aggregation on the user ID, and then you have a having clause to throw about to only get the, the, the result that has more than two users. So if your optimizer is good, you could re obviously you, you could rewrite it like this. You remove the nested query, extract out the inner query. So remove the outer query, extract out the inner query, but bring in pieces of the, of the outer query into the, the new query here. Right? So now you get rid of the join. Assume you have a, you have a uh, well, you do sequential scan, and as soon as you find the, the first, on your aggregation, as soon as you find the first element that has more than two, two, two orders, then you can, plop, you can drop out, and you're done. Postgres can't do this. Um, I think Oracle can. I, I, haven't, I didn't try SQL Server. I also didn't try DuckDB. All right, so another way to do this uh, is a uh, type of subquery is through what are called lateral joins. And the idea here, and this, this is what the, the apply operator is going to be a cross apply that was, that was in the SQL Server, uh, the, in the Freud paper. SQL, in the SQL standard, I think it's apply. In Postgres and in, in most other systems like Oracle, I think DuckDB, they use the lateral join keyword, but it's basically the same thing. So the idea here is that we're going to allow uh, uh, inner queries can, can, or allow queries to access or reference the, the attributes with other tables, or sorry, other queries that are at the, sort of the same nesting level as it. So going back to my example here, this inner query here can reference the outer table, right? But the outer query table can't reference anything on the inner, inner table. With a lateral join, if they're at the same nesting level, then you can, you, can, you can reference each other, right? So this can allow you to have a bunch of subqueries in the from clause that can, can reference each other without having to you know, keep embedding down nest and nest, 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 keep nesting them within, within each other, right? And so the way it's going to work is that as you're going to iterate through every t table, each row in the table, uh, and then you, if there's an inner query, you've got to reference each other row. Uh, and then you combine them together as if it was a join, just like, like a regular query. So look at an example like this. So this is the same query we had before. We're going to retrieve the first user that has made at least, at least two purchases. Uh, but now we're going to also include the timestamps of the, of the first and, and the, the next order that the customer actually made. So it's, it's ref but basically the same as the, the next query I showed before, but we're actually now also getting timestamps. So you see this part in here, this is the nested query, but it's at the same nesting level as this query up here because I'm referencing this inner join with the lateral keyword here, right? So you can see inside of now this query, I can reference the user ID of uh, this inner query, this query up here, and then the first order can be referenced to this one here. You wouldn't be able to do that if, the, if these were nested just two regular queries without the, uh, without the lateral keyword. So is this clear? This is the building block that Freud's going to use to make, to make this inlining stuff work. We probably should add this to be an assignment in, uh, for 445, like for the first homework, right? All right, so let's go through now an example of how Freud's going to work. So there's five steps. So the first step, you're going to take the, uh, all the T-SQL statements that they have written in the UDF, and you're going to convert them into SQL statements. Now, for examples here, I'm going to show the conversion being done in SQL statements because uh, it's easier to show and understand in, in the slides. But in the actual implementation, they're doing they're generating logical plans or relational algebra expressions, right? right? They're not they're not they're not dealing from SQL to SQL. We'll see the AppFell approach in a second, which is SQL to SQL. In this case here, or converting generating SQL from from the UDF statements. In this case here, for simplicity, I'm showing SQL. So we take the statements, transform it into SQL commands, uh, and then we're going to divide the UDF into regions that's going to allow us to reason about what the dependencies and the contents of the different regions are. 
and then we'll combine those regions together uh, into a, a single single SQL statement. And then we're going to take all the all the different regions, combine it, uh, or attach them together with lateral joins, and then inline the UDF expression into the to the query. And then take this updated query with all these now embedded SQL commands with lateral joins, shove that through the query optimizer, and, and let it do whatever optimizations that it, that it wants to do. Right. All right, so let's walk through an example. All right, so again, this is derived from the Floyd paper. Uh, so it's that example where I showed before, like you check to see whether the amount of orders that someone has purchased is above a million dollars and they, they, they get a platinum status. Otherwise, they're regular status. So the first step is we want to, again, convert the, the T SQL or the PLPG SQL statements into, uh, or commands into SQL statements. So in the case of the first one here, we set the, the, the level variable to platinum. So that's the same as just doing a select with a constant string platinum and then assigning it to the, in our projection output, to be level. In the case of assigning the sum variable, or sorry, the total variable to be the summation defined with this aggregate query here, that's the same thing as doing a nested query, compute the aggregation, then taking whatever the output is, the scalar output of the aggregation, and assigning it to the total, at, uh, total attribute in our projection output. For the if clause here, uh, we can't directly express if clauses in SQL, at least in the SQL standard. Um, I think my SQL has something. But we can use case statements, right? Case when total is greater than a million, then assign the, then the output of the scalar output is platinum. Otherwise, it's null, meaning unknown. And again, we sign that to be uh, the, the, at the level attribute in our output list. So in my example here, I'm showing a one-to-one -one mapping like for one command in PLBG SQL or, or in the UDF. That converts to one, one SQL statement. Uh, and so for all the examples, this, this is the case. This, this is true. It doesn't have to be. Um, you could have one command be multiple SQL statements, or you could have Multiple commands could be combined to a single SQL statement. But for simplicity, we'll, we'll, we'll always do one to one. All right, so now the next step is we want to take our, our original UDF and then break it up into, uh, into regions. Again, the original paper, they would construct relational algebra expressions for these different regions. For our purposes here, we're going to put this into SQL. So this first region here, you see that we declare uh, two variables. We have total. And then level, right? Total float level as a bar char. Then we're going to take, uh, run the SQL query here, where you compute the summation and assign it to total. So in this, so in the in the for this particular region here, we're going to now define in our output list uh, two values. We're going to have the level, but we're going to set that to be null because it's undefined. We we didn't we didn't assign it to anything here. And then we know that the, for the total attribute, that's going to be whatever the output of this, this sub summation is, this, sub this aggregation query here. Right? So that's going to be, the, the, again, the total variable here. But now we're going to assign the, 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 the tuple that comes out of this, this, this first region here to a temporary table called ER1. Right? So this region, when we execute this code, Right? The output will be put into whatever this, this table is here. Now in the second region, we're going to do our, uh, our if clause, greater, you know, total greater than, than a million, and sign it as a platinum. So in here, in our, in our case statement here, just like before, if total now is greater than, than a million, where the level, actually, sorry, this would be a line here, total is, is being defined by this, this variable here. Otherwise, we're going to uh, we're going to reference. Then we sign the level to be platinum. Otherwise, we're going to set it to be whatever the whatever the value is that was defined from the, the previous table, which is null because we we doesn't we haven't done anything yet. So again, if you go back over here at this point in the code, we haven't gotten down to the the else clause. So unless total is greater than a million dollars, then it's going to be null, as because we we didn't define it up here, right? Then the, the, the third region here, again, it's basically the, 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 instead of having this else, you have to do the inverse of this or the, of the, the negation of this. So it's, 
If the total is less than equal to a million, then you assign it to, to regular. Uh, and then otherwise, the level is just whatever came out of this level in, in the second table. Right? And then the last region here, we'll, co we'll cover in the next slide. It's just, it's just the output of, of, of whatever, whatever this guy's level is. Right? So you kind of see where we're going with this. That would like for each region, we're going to use some kind of computation in purely SQL. And then the, the variables that are getting passed along from one region to the next are assigned to these temp tables. And then the next region can then reference that temp table, which is why we need the lateral join, because we want to be able to have one table reference the values that are in another table at the same nesting level. All right, so now the next step is we want, we want, we want to merge these expressions into uh, one giant SQL statement. Right? And again, I'm showing cross apply, same thing as a lateral join. Right? And it's just as I said, we're, we, now we have our three temp tables ER1, ER2, ER3. ER ER Each of these sort of blocks within the cross apply can reference the previous one as needed. But then at the very top, this is where the, the return clause is, where we're just taking whatever the output of this query and we're just returning whatever the ER3 uh, level result is. Right? Again, so each region is going to depend on the, on the computation performed in the previous region. And the cross apply allows it to sort of execute these in, 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 in sort of sequential order. So now at this point here, this giant SQL statement here is equivalent to the UDF. It'll produce, produce the same result. And we can verify this. We're like, we, we're like, we can prove that this is the case. So now what we need to do is take that giant SQL statement and then basically inline or inject it into the original call and query. Right? So assume that this thing here, this, they call this customer level uh, UDF or the customer key. Well, that's basically invoking, can be written into this query like this. Right? So we do get the customer key. Then we have the inline computation from our uh, converted UDF from the customer table. So for every single record in the customer table, we're going to invoke this, this nested query mess here with all the same regions that we had before. All right? Again, this is why, the, uh, like, this is very impressive. They can take arbitrary UDF and convert it into SQL statements. You can't do it for all possible UDFs. We'll see what, what cases they can't. Like you, they don't handle, you can't have while loops in UDS, at least in Freud. The outfell approach will be, will be able to handle that. So then now we take the SQL query, we, we throw it to the query optimizer, uh, and then it's going to end up rewriting it to something like this, where it, it, it broke out all the, uh, it rewrote all the, the lateral joins into a uh, sim simple left outer join. Uh, and then the case clause is now in the is, is in the projection output list of the SQL query. All right? So we have an implicit join group being made explicit using the left outer join, and it was able to rewrite that. Uh, all the all the uh, all now the the operations that were within the UDF that were treated as a black box before. Now, it's, since it's just SQL, the query optimizer knows that it can reason about the selectivity and the cost of these things. It can do whatever you know, optimizations that it wants to do. There's no function calls to, or context switch overhead of like, for every single row, invoke some function, set up like stack and all that stuff. All that's gone, right? And we didn't have to change anything in our query optimizer to do this. Because now it's just, you know, the query optimizer is not going to know that, you know, well, in this case here. It was, it was given this. It doesn't know that this, that this was written by Freud. It just applies all the same rules to do transformations to get it down to a more compact form and more efficient form like any other query. All right, any questions so far? All right, so for me, I like Freud because also I can, um, this is probably a naive statement. I can actually understand it. The outfail approach, we'll talk about in a second, it gets in the PL world, which I don't understand. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll take it as it is. It comes along. OK. So let's look at some additional optimizations you can get. Uh, if, again, if you can inline your, your UDS into SQL, there's a bunch of cool things that the, that the, 
again, the query app manager is going to be able to do that starts to look a lot like what a regular or a, a like a traditional uh, compiler like GCC or Clang can do for your you know, for arbitrary code. So say I have a really simple UDF where for given some constant value as an integer, it returns back a string that says whether it's a high value or a low value based on whether the value is greater than 1,000. Right? So you just have a SQL function that, or a SQL query that, that evokes the function like this. So if you were to inline this with Freud, you would convert this uh, UDF into a into a, you know, to, to inline query like this okay, with, with the with the the uh, the lateral join. So now the, in the next phase, because again this is this is being invoked in the query, when you pass in a constant value, the optimizer can say, okay, well, I know what the value of the input parameter being passed in, the x value is. So it can do dynamic slicing and throw away the, you know, this portion of the else clause or the, or the case statement because uh, it knows that, that x is going to be greater than, than 1,000. It knows it's never going to actually uh, look at this. So it can entirely throw away the case statement and just only, only return high, the, the string high. Right? That's equivalent to the same thing as a, as a traditional optimizer could do. Say, oh, I know this is a dead branch. Let me just go ahead and I'm never going to invoke it. Let me just throw it away. Then you can also do constant propagation and folding, further recognizing that the again the value of x has already been known, so you don't need to do uh, this outer apply. Or you just, you just combine these two into a single select statement and just return the candidate string high value. Right, same thing up above. Right, you don't need to declare the uh, wait. You, you don't need to do the concatenation of you know, creating the string value. Right, actually this line should be removed too. Sorry. Right? You just return high value because you know it's exactly what, that it's always going to be the same. And then, and then lastly, you do the dead code elimination. You have things you, don't, you, know, you don't need. right? And then you return it through a single, single select statement. Right? Again, we can do this because if we, if we get with Freud, we convert the UDF into our variational algebra form, then the optimizer would do this again for, as if it was any other query. All right, this only works, again, if it's going back to the beginning here. I can do all these things because I'm passing in a constant, right? All right, so in the 2019 version of Freud, uh, they can support, support these, uh, these commands in T-SQL. Again, the key thing that they're missing is you can't do loops, you can't do exceptions, you can't do, uh, can't do cursors. Um, and we'll see in a second, but they claim that over about 60% of the UDS they, they, they see in the real world uh, could be covered by, by, by this the syntax here, right? And it can handle all possible data types. It can have UDS call other UDS. There's a parameter you can set to say how, how deep you want to unnest. Like if I have a UDF call like seven levels deep, maybe I don't want to inline all the way. I, I forget what the default is in SQL Server. But and they also, they also can't support dynamic SQL queries. If I you know, create a SQL string, start concatenating to it, and then in invoke it. All right, so in the paper, they talked about when they looked at real workloads, and they, they were trying to figure out, again, what level of compatibility they would have, or what sort of, how many UDS would they actually support with, with, the, with just the constructs that I showed in the last slide. And for three real-world workloads, they see they, they get about uh, you know, over 80% for them, you know, compatibility with them. I think, again, across the entire fleet of all the SQL Server uh, databases that they had access to, I think it's about 60,000. I'm sorry, six, sorry, 60 percent of the UDFs could be in line with Freud. Again, this study was done in 2019. I don't think in the newer versions of, of any updates to Freud still can't handle loops and things like that. So it's, it's, so it's you know, roughly still 60 percent. So they have this graph in the paper, which is quite impressive, where they show for these two different workloads uh, what the percentage of speed up they're getting for these queries, or the improvement factor they're getting for these queries, uh, when they're able to, to do the inlining. Right? And so the way to think about this, the, the x-axis for both these graphs are unique invocations of, of different UDS uh, when you enable Freud. 
Uh, and in some cases, you're getting almost up to 1,000x improvement, right? Because, again, you're, you're able to do this inlining and not have to invoke the UDF you know, one, at, one for one row after another. So I always say every, 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 every semester when I teach, teach this, this, this topic, this is amazing, right? Like, how often are there updates to your database server when you get a 1,000x improvement for, for queries? It doesn't happen that often, right? Like, uh, unless you're like doing something really stupid, like like picking the worst join order and then the update fix, fixes the join order. But even then, you, I, it's very unlikely you're going to get a thousand x. So so like again, one, this is the beauty of SQL that like they, you know you you don't have to change any application. You just say I want Freud or I want this fe the inlining feature, and you've got this huge improvement. Uh, and then Sam will show some examples in a second that like people there's people tweeting out how much how much they love this this feature, how much better they got. And then Sam will pop that balloon and uh, <laughs> tell who he really thinks. OK. All right, so any questions about Freud? Again, I, I think this is very impressive. This, this is, I, Freud is obviously, the technique is obviously patented by Microsoft. So there isn't another system that, that's going to do anything like this exactly the same way for a long time until right, till the patent expires. Yes? The question is, you can pat your question whether you can pat techniques like this. Like software. It's a software patent, absolutely yes. But aren't they like notoriously easy to get around? Like uh, Microsoft has in-house lawyers that are very expensive. <laughs> Do you want to roll the dice? <laughs> right, let me phrase that. If you're Oracle, would you roll the dice? No, no. right? Uh, could Postgres implement something like this? Uh, I, I don't know how much that's been litigated, right? Because there isn't a corporation for Postgres, right? There's, there's, so, but there is, I mean, there's a nonprofit. You could, you could sue that. Uh, but no, like, again, like, there's, well, so, again, next slide will be the next technique, another way to do this, get the similar benefit. And I think that would be, that, I think that would not in, encroach on the patents. So like, could, could, you, could we write a research paper that extends Freud and do something better? Yes. Can we make a product and sell it as a competitor to Microsoft? Probably not. Again, and, and like Microsoft would, would destroy it. Like all the major corporations have in-house lawyers that like all they do is this kind of stuff. Okay, we can take we can take we can take legal stuff online. But yeah, software patents are a thing, right? Like the problem is also too with there's people get software patents. And then like the company folds, and like patent trolls buy them, and then they sue you in Texas, right? So there is no company. There's just a holding company that owns the patent, and they, they sue big corporations and this kind of stuff. We'll take that offline. Okay. All right. So Apfel is a technique from uh, another set of Germans that are also very good, uh, and but it's going to be just like Freud, where they want to convert UDS into something they can inline to the SQL query, but instead of using relation algebra expressions, they're going to convert it into CTEs, common table expressions, right? And what's fascinating about this is that they're going to support some of the control flow uh, co constructs that, like loops, uh, I don't think they can do exceptions, but looping they can do in the way Freud cannot. And instead of actually being directly embedded inside the database server, the way Freud is, they can actually be implemented as a, as a separate middleware that sits above the database server. You put your UDS in there, you put your SQL queries in there, and then it'll spit out SQL queries that you can then invoke on the underlying database system. So they're trying to be database agnostic. Although I think they're only, they only support uh, these Postgres. They're, they have an online demo. I was down. I, don't, I, I couldn't get, get to it. But if, if I can find it, I'll post it on Piazza, what it looks like. So this technique is going to be again, more PLE than, uh, uh, than, than Freud is. So I'm not going to be able to understand everything that, that it's actually doing. But the, the basic way the basic is going to work is that you're going to turn your uh, turn your UDF uh, code into these intermediate, intermediate representations like the SSA or SSSA and the administrative normal form, and then you'll be able to convert it then to an administrative normal form, then convert it back into tail recursive functions, and then from there you can then spit out recursive CTEs. So let's walk through this and then stop me if if it gets confusing, or if someone knows what this is going on beyond me because they're taking compilers of PL, let me know. 
All right, so here we have a UDF that's going to compute the power function. All right, so the, the part of the, the UDF that we care about the most is this while loop here, right? Where we're going to give in, uh, you know, for, for some iterator to be defined as i, and for the number of, of times we want, we want to take the exponent or take, you know, multiply by itself, we loop through that, update our value, and, then re and return it, right? So again, this is PLBG SQL. It looks a lot like T SQL, except there's no at signs for, for variables, right? So they're going to convert this into the static single uh, assignment, but that's going to be based entirely off of go-tos, right? So the control flow is going to be expressed through, through go-to statements. So I define my variables at the top, then I have my, my clause for the while loop. If I, my iterator is, uh, is less than n, if we, uh, loop back or loop down here, I do, do my computation. Otherwise, go to the exit. Then I do my computation, and I go back up, up to the top, right? So far, so good. Then we need to convert this into the administrative neural form, which contains mutually, recur mutually recursive functions uh, that are only in the, in, the, in the tail clause. So now, again, it's just like before, but we would have in these different blocks, uh, we have a jump to this function here to do the while loop. This then jumps to the function that does the body. And then this has a recursive jump into the uh, back, back to the while loop again, right? And otherwise, again, if we complete our iteration, then this function pops out. We pop up the stack, and we, and we return a result to the power function at the top. And then, then now we need to convert this from uh, neutral recursion into t uh, direct tail recursion, where the, the only place where that we're allowed to uh, call another function is always at the, the last command at the end of the function. Right, so we start we start a function here. We then can loop through this this run clause down here, which then will call back itself. Otherwise, if we don't if we, if we finish our looping, then we pop up the stack and then we're done here. Right. So the reason why we want to put it in this form is 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 because now when we call our convert this to SQL, the the output of the function is to be always be whatever the, the last computation actually the last thing that gets computed in, in the function. Right? The, the output of the SQL statement should be the last thing in the function. So if we need another call another thing here, we want our output to be whatever this thing returns. All right, so now we can convert the, this tail recursive thing into CTEs. So, yeah, so bear with me. Okay, so here we have now the a single CTE with, that's recursive. So you have the union all operator uh, where the CTE is allowed to call itself. So the name of the CTE is run. Uh, this thing here is a string we're passing in to say, uh, should I call or not? Uh, and then it, inside of this, we're basically do another nested query, do union unit all, where we're, we're as if it was iterating over to reproduce our output, right? So the first part is here, and the, these inner parts are uh, the, uh, combined together into the single SQL, SQL statement here. We're done, right? This is now valid SQL that we can run. There's some stuff that, that's code gen or programmatic stuff, like this, this constant string call that we're passing around. That's an artifact of how, how this actually works. Uh, but this, this point here, th this, is, this is valid SQL that's, rep that's representative of what the, the original UDF was doing. So to this point, there hasn't been an evaluation of uh, the CTEFL approach against Freud. We were trying to do that here at CMU uh, in the old system noise page, uh, but we, our optimizer couldn't, do all the, couldn't handle the lateral joins the way, the way we needed to. Um, and so in the paper from the Apple guys, they have a comparison where they compare in Postgres the, the PLS SQL approach versus the CTE approach as you scale up the number of iterations in that PAL function. Um, unfortunately, in all of the, in the, the outfall papers, they all have these sort of derived UDFs. There is, there is a benchmark uh, that, that the four guys put out that came, came out after this paper came out that has rep, 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 workloads. But this is sort of obvious here that, you, as you would expect, there is an overhead of all these different CTEs, but it's still going to be cheaper than 
having to do the context switch into the PL SQL code. OK? All right, so any questions about, about Freud or Apfel? All right, so <laughs> Sam's going to give a, a, a guest sub lecture. Here's the clicker. So put this in my pocket. Uh, you put it in your pocket. Can you attach it? Yeah, can you attach it? All right. I don't, you don't really want to touch students, but. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, easy. And there's your clicker. Cool, cool. All right, go for it. All right, awesome. Okay, so Freud, what happened next? What happened after the paper came out? So as uh, Andy mentioned, it was released in SQL Server. It was actually shipped in a, as a feature in SQL Server. And then after that, there was huge performance wins in the wild. So from Carthix Twitter, we see a bunch of posts like this, 100-fold <laughs> improvement in UDF performance, um, order of magnitude, dramatic performance gains due to Freud. Um, you know, the CPU time is three times lower. Uh, the query is more than 20 times faster, right? Here it goes from four minutes, 25 seconds to nine seconds, right? Huge performance wins from Freud in the wild. Um, and of course, high praise from Andy, right? So when he was asked, what are the 10, oh, what, what are the papers in the last decade um, that are your favorite? In no particular order, of course, Freud was listed first, right? <laughs> Um, and Andy says this, I've said it before, but Carthex UDF inlining is one of the most important query optimiza optimization techniques for databases developed in the last decade. I dedicated an entire class on Freud, my advanced DB course in 2020. That's this class. Which is this class, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so since then, right, um, to motivate more research in this area, there was this paper that was released, the Prof Bench paper, by uh, Carthex, right? And the reason is that if there's no benchmark, it's really hard for researchers to do more work on UDFs, right? Um, so that's this paper, Procedural Extensions of SQL, Understanding Their Usage in the Wild. So what came out of this paper, um, yeah, the Microsoft team published a paper, an analysis of real world UDFs, TVFs, uh, triggers, stored procedures. So it was the first time that um, researchers, the public, had like a real insight into what do these procedural extensions look like in the wild, right? And then with this was this benchmark that was released, and it's on GitHub, the SQL proc bench, right? So finally, we can benchmark and see uh, like what are the performance of these different UDF techniques, right? And the authors of the paper argue that proc bench faithfully represents real world workloads. Um, so from the proc bench, I would classify two sort of different types of UDFs. So the first sort of style of UDF is something like this. So it's a UDF that takes no parameters, right? And it's just invoked like this, right? So when you have something like this, where the UDF is invoked only once, the wins, the performance wins that you can get from inlining are pretty minimal, right? Because you're not doing any sort of like joins between like an outer table and a table inside the UDF, right? Um, but if you have something like this, which is like um, the example that Andy was showing earlier, you know, you're computing the customer level for every customer, and inside this UDF, you're doing a select query where you're sort of matching on that customer key. You're doing this implicit join between the customer table and the orders table, which is kind of like almost like a nested loop join, right? So inlining that as a subquery, if the optimizer can see, oh yeah, I can just turn this into like a hash join or something like that it's gonna be like orders of magnitude better, right? That's like where the real wins come from Freud, okay? So naturally, what we did when we saw that this benchmark released was, okay, Freud is already in SQL Server 2019, okay? So why don't we just test the proc bench on SQL Server 2019? And we found some surprising results. So what's surprising is that SQL Server's optimizer could only decorrelate two out of 13 of the UDFs in the proc bench that are called with parameters, right? And you can imagine that if the optimizer can't decorrelate um, the, the join in the, the subquery in the UDF, you're basically doing a nested loop join, and then the performance is gonna be super, super bad, right? And then what we did is we manually sort of Freuded these UDFs and gave them to Umbra. And Umbra was able to get 13 out of 13. It was able to decorrelate every single subquery. So why? 
So the way that SQL Server does subqueries is based off this paper from 2001, orthogonal optimization of subqueries and aggregation. And the idea is that they have these rewrite rules, and then they just blindly execute these rewrite rules where they can. But some of these rewrites may potentially involve duplicating the sub-expressions in multiple places in the query plan tree. So maybe you can decorrelate by replacing it in multiple, uh, but putting the uh, sub-expression in multiple places ends up being more expensive. So what they do is they leave this kind of decorrelation up to the query optimizer to decide based off cost, should I, optimize, should I decorrelate, should I not decorrelate, right? On the other hand, the way that the Germans do it is based off this paper, unnesting arbitrary queries, where they can systematically eliminate and decorrelate any subquery. So the way that, that they do that is they introduce a dependent join operator, and then they use a query plan DAG instead of a query plan tree. And this allows them to reuse sub-expressions without having to actually like compute them multiple times. And as a result, they can systematically decorrelate any subquery, no matter how convoluted. This is why in practice, it's always getting decorrelated. Um, the 13 out of 13 UDFs get decorrelated, but SQL Server can only handle two, right? So what are the implications here when it comes to UDF inlining? Well, to start with, UDF inlining as a technique is amazing. There's huge wins uh, practically, right? Orders of magnitude performance improvement, right? Um, but to get the real benefits of UDF inlining, uh, again, assuming that like these UDFs in the proc band do represent real world um, UDFs, you really do have to have a German style query optimizer that can just crunch through and decorrelate all these subqueries. Otherwise, you're left doing this correlated evaluation and then you're just screwed, right? So that's why uh, for our research, what we're doing is we're extending DuckDB, which has a German style query optimizer, so they can have support for UDFs and we can do all our UDF research there. So the takeaway is Freud is amazing, right? Andy will agree, right? But uh, the emphasis should be like, you need a really good query optimizer to get the most out of Freud. Yeah. Finish the class. Oh, finish the class? All right. Okay, so anyways, this is huge, right? <laughs> you rarely get 500x speed up without either switching to a new DBMS or rewriting your application, right? It says here, another optimization approach is to compile the UDF into machine code. I think that was covered already, right? But it doesn't solve the optimizer's problem. You really need something like inlining to be able to like realize that you're doing a subquery and like get rid of that join, right? All right. So in the next class, we're going to be talking about database networking protocols. Any questions? <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so y'all yeah, fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with fifth one, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>